China's real estate bubble has been adjusting and the consequence is not what people in the West have been telling you about. I know from personal experience, this is my house deed. So watch this video to understand why this situation is so different from the subprime mortgage debacle in America back in 2008 and what Xi Jinping meant when he proclaimed that China needed houses for living, not for speculating. First off, I would like to acknowledge that I wouldn't be able to be making this video had I not learned uh, what I learned in order to share with you. And that would have not been possible without the substantial financial help that me and my wife received from my family back home in Colombia and my in-laws here in China as well. And well, this is not a research paper on, on the matter, of course, but here's the thing, after 22 years in the country, and nine years of marriage, we just bought a brand new second-hand home in Dongguan. And I'm going to explain a little bit that second-hand brand new thing later. Now, through the long process of purchasing my first piece of real estate ever in my life, I mean, I do own two other units that I inherited, but that's not the same. You understand what I mean? Now, back to the story. Through the process, I noticed that the information that I was coming across closely correlated to only one side of the truth being told behind the financial issues that speculators were experiencing here in China. And I noticed that a lot of focus was being given to the pain that these speculators were enduring, but very little attention was given to the blessings for a large part of the population that became first owners like us. But first, I would like to share with you some personal background. I moved to China in 2001, but I never really thought that I would spend the rest of my life here. Back then, this was a very young country, only 50 years old, right? And it had land and home ownership rules that I don't really understand at the time. But the consensus among friends, Chinese, foreigners, and whatever, and even some scholars and international lawyers, as you will see here, the people from the Vanderbilt Journal of Transnational Law, the idea was that in China, you do not own a home. You do not own the land. You only get use of the land for 70 years. And that is an important calculation because 70 years of land ownership minus 50 years of history as a very young country back when I arrived, right, 2001, this actually meant that over the course of my 20 years here, I would have the opportunity to see how these discussions, how this changes to, to land and home ownership would take place and what the CPC would do when they started to deal with the first instances of land ownership coming due on October 1st, 2019, when they were due to go back to the government. This is why, even after I had decided to develop my professional career here in China around 2004, 2005, when I set up the first of my five different companies here, buying a property just never crossed my mind. And even though at the time, I was able to probably buy a modern three-bedroom apartment every year with my income at the time here in Dongguan without impinging on my lifestyle, I never did. It was never a thought in my mind. I was thinking like, for what? If I cannot own it, what's the point of having property? Now, to underline this particular point, this article that was written by the Vanderbilt law firm that I just mentioned confirms exactly that. Even by 2017, the three questions about land ownership still had no answers. Those questions were, well, does a holder of a land have the ability to renew that right when it expires? And if the holder has this ability, must it pay some money to renew the right? And if it did, how much would they have to pay percentage or amount? That was all uncertainty that existed just two years before the first batch of 70-year ownership rights will be due for returning to the government, to the people. Having said that, the talk among friends in government and high circles here in Dongguan, my friends, was that China was actually planning to pass legislation in order to renew ownership rights at a certain fee. It wasn't clear, real, really clear what the fee would, would be, but think of it as the tax that you pay when you inherit property in the West. I know that rich people find always ways to avoid that tax, but that's, that's a different discussion for a different video. Now, my problem was that this information circulated around me a little bit too late for me. 
I heard this at a time when I literally could no longer afford a nice place in a central district here in Dongguan. By 2019, I would have had to work a whole month just to buy a single square meter. The speculators in the city and in the country had accomplished their objective and the middle class of China was being left behind in the real estate market or forced to rent, not buy. I'm sure that sounds familiar to a lot of people in the West these days. Perhaps this is a good time to remind you to hit the like button if you're enjoying this video and find it interesting. Thank you so much in advance. Okay, so let's get back to the story. Now, it becomes a little bit important to explain where I live, where Dongguan is located. Dongguan is in Guangdong, in the south of China, between Shenzhen and Guangzhou. I'm sure you've heard about these two cities because they're very close to Hong Kong, which, as you all know, is one of the most expensive real estate markets on the planet and that's going to be important for this video so as the mainland started to develop rapidly since 1979 and the reform and opening up many foreign investors have started coming to china but particularly since 2001 when china entered the wto cities like shenzhen and guangzhou quickly became really modern mega cities that you probably have all seen on many youtube videos these opportunities and the speed of development attracted investors and industries and, and, and permanent residents from around the world. And as high as real estate was then, or still is now, both in Shenzhen and Guangzhou, it was and still is several times cheaper than Hong Kong or Singapore, for example. So you can see where this video is going, right? For more than two decades now, speculators from Hong Kong, from Taiwan, from other parts of China as well, and, and also some foreigners, they flooded these markets, buying property left and right. Anything that came out, they would buy. They were all getting huge valuations on their portfolios and their equity as they kept on pumping the bubble larger and larger each year. But it was around 2011 that the whole mega CD project idea first surfaced in the media and I honestly cannot believe that I'm quoting Gordon Chang in his article for Forbes but he's very good at taking facts and then twisting them into dystopian nightmares but let us move on okay this video will prove that it was not so so the mega city project intended to turn the Pearl River Delta into one ginormous city the plan would effectively merge uh, Guangzhou, Shenzhen, Dongguan, Foshan, Huizhou, Zhaoxing, Jiangmen, Zhongshan, and Zhuhai into a single mega city with a geographical size that would be even larger than Switzerland. And while well, the government did the deed and spent 2 trillion yuan, or about $300 billion, building 29 rail lines that today allow residents to go from one urban city to another in an hour or less, as well as spending much more money building other 150 infrastructure improvements that enhance transportation, logistics, energy, water, telecommunications, everything. The fact is that this megacity, as an administrative entity, is not yet a reality. It's all built in, it's all interconnected, but it's not an administrative unit yet. All this interconnectivity and infrastructure somehow put Dongguan in the crosshairs of real estate vultures. Both developers and private investors saw it as honeypot. And this is a key aspect to understand the difference between the 2008 subprime mortgage bubble in America and the real estate situation that China is experiencing. Our bubble was inflated to dangerous levels, yes, by unscrupulous developers and private speculators who gambled on the timing of the deflation. But the fact is that the infrastructure that was built, and not only here in Guangdong, but all around the country, where also real estate prices had ballooned as well, contributed a great deal to the valuation of those properties. That infrastructure exists and will remain useful for decades to come. This is perhaps the most important reason why China will not collapse, as Western pundits like to say, even with these real estate issues. These uh, means of production are there, 
and they will continue to bring benefits for the citizens and, and give revenue to local governance for many, many years. But let's get back to, to my personal experience, so I'd like to close the loop. We bought our loft on New Year's Eve of 2023, so just a couple of weeks ago. It's a, it's a garden, it's a condo that was open for sales late 2019. The stories that I hear is that the flats were being sold at around 25,000 RMB per square meter or 3,500 US dollars per square meter, and that the entire 1,500 units were sold within a few days, mostly to Shenzhen and Hong Kong buyers. The expression that was used by my neighbor was that they were selling them like fresh vegetables. People were buying four, five, even 10 units at a time. She herself, she bought two for each of the kids. So now imagine how attractive that is. The possibility of doubling your portfolio in under a decade while paying peanuts in mortgages. I mean, when you compare to mortgages in Hong Kong or Shenzhen, the mortgages, the mortgages in, in Dongguan are just really, really tiny. Of course, a lot of these lofts remained empty. They were just cash cows that were left in green pastures. So why would people bother with tenants, right? This explains uh, a lot of the ghost CT videos that you see from some anti-China YouTubers that was all part of this bubble that took place. And then COVID hit. Now, I'm not telling you anything new, right? But in comes the perfect storm with this COVID situation that has made now headlines around the world. Huge developers like Evergrande realized since late 2020, 2021, they had been stretched too thin, and this COVID-driven illiquidity suddenly became a problem for them. People went into saving mode during the pandemic, and then panic ensued, and speculators started to realize that this Ponzi scheme was about to falter, and everybody started running for the exits. Now, interestingly, and in contrast to the US, Beijing refused to bail out the developers. The message was very clear. If you owe your creditors, you better sell your assets. That's a very refreshing thought, right? Capitalism with guardrails to protect people. So prison sentences were handed, restructuring of debts were devised, some heads rolled, and both speculators and, in all fairness, many families lost equity. But equity is funny in a way that if your equity is borrowed, you really are in for a lot of hurt. But if your equity is owned and paid for, you can most certainly simply just ride the storm and come out the other end unscathed. This is why most families in China did not lose the roof above their heads. Yes, they lost valuation, they lost equity, but not assets. Speculators, on the other hand, well, some of them were forced to sell at a loss. Large speculators, like the person who bought 10 lofts here, could probably sell two or three and decide to continue to make payments on the other units while this storm passes, hoping to break even after a few years. And that is basically how my wife and I became homeowners for the first time. We bought our second-hand, yet never lived in, loft at 45% of what the Hong Kong owners bought it for, just four years ago. Now, I have to say that it was a weir weird experience, shaking hands with the owners, the look of defeat and at the same time relief in their faces because they were being unburdened from that debt. But that was a heavy contrast with our glimmers of happiness and hope as we bought our first unit. And the truth is that our story is not unique. The day that we came to see these lofts here in this garden, the same agent that was working with us sold four units. And the very next day when we came again, he sold three more. The fact is we also visited two other projects and they were actual lines to go in and see units for sale. Now, if you take this personal experience and extrapolate it throughout China, you start to get uh, why the doomsayers are not really painting the whole picture. The whole idea is buy low and sell high, right? Huge capital in China is going to cast the white net and grab the real estate. Not so fast. China has passed several important reforms since this debacle. Number one, they increased the taxes on second homes. 
so it's more expensive to buy. They also limited the number of homes that a household can own. Now, you're not forced to sell what you have, but you cannot add any more. And number three, and this is a little bit old, they forbid sales of properties within five years of the original uh, purchase date. So yeah, buy low, sell high, but for first home owners, for people like us, the words of Xi Jinping became a reality. We paid for our home cash. We have no mortgage. So from now on and for the rest of our lives, any income becomes 100% savings. We are going to be able to spend more. We're going to be able to consume more now that we are homeowners. And this is also true for a large number of Chinese families under similar circumstances. And given China's infrastructure that you've all heard about, given its productive prowess and the outlook in the global south towards China's economy, we know that our newly acquired equity will bounce back more realistically this time around, but we know that we got time in our hands. All right, friends, that's what I wanted to share with you today. Thank you very much for watching. And if you want more insights into real China, like this video, make sure to subscribe to my channel. As always, make sure to like, comment and share this video with people who are not really getting the complete picture when it comes to China. And well, until I see you again, take it easy and bye for now.